Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day. And as we gather here today, Lord, we ask that you pour down your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may uh, be open to your word, that we may be moved by your spirit, and so that, Lord God, we may walk the path of holiness that you have entrusted, that you have destined for us, Lord God. Because, Lord God, you know our hearts and you know our minds. And so we entrust this evening to you, and we give everything that is happening for end this evening for the greater glory of your name. And we make this prayer in the holy name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. All right. We have some pizza, so uh, we're, we're, we're going to be a little bit more interactive. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry in advance. But, uh, so my name is Pierre. Um, as uh, Alexander said, I'm originally from Haiti. Just wanted to say thank you to uh, Alexander for inviting me. Uh, she first came out and she's like, oh, why don't you just come and talk to uh, our new ones? I'm like, me? <laughs> really? Okay, sure. Uh, just wanted to start with a story. So, uh, 12 years ago, uh, November 12 years ago, I, uh, my mom and I were in Windsor, uh, well, Michigan, Michigan, the US. Uh, it was around 7 o'clock in, uh, in the evening, and we had just came from Florida because we were leaving the States. And we were, st we were, st we were staying at a hotel. Uh, and the hotel was the, or where we were staying, was the border between Michigan and Windsor. And uh, that evening, uh, it was a pretty tumultuous evening. I didn't sleep because there was a lot of um, uh, immigration officers running around because they knew a lot of the immigrants were basically crossing the border. Uh, and then they essentially came to our hotel room, kind of knocked on a couple of doors, grabbed a couple folks. Uh, and by the grace of God, they kind of skipped our room. So, long story short, I didn't sleep uh, at all. My mom was snoring, but I didn't. Uh, four o'clock, uh, we got up, uh, took a cab, got to um, uh, Central Michigan. Apparently, the gentleman that was driving us didn't have his papers either. Uh, so, got a hold of one of his friends. Uh, the friend told us, you have an appointment? We're like, yes, we did not have an appointment. Um, proceeded to go, so if you know anything about Michigan, you could either enter through the tunnel, which is uh, American custom, or you could go through the border, uh, the bridge, the ambassador bridge, uh, and that has the Canadians. So they explicitly told us, go through the border, uh, go through the bridge, do not go through the tunnel. So the gentleman wanted to go through the tunnel, like, no, we're not going through the tunnel, we're going through the bridge. Uh, and we didn't know that to get to the bridge, uh, you were trespassing private property. So we have this guy trespassing private property, and less than five minutes, we have three cop cars behind us. He's going through the bridge. He says, we should stop. I said, no, we're not stopping. We need to get to the bridge. Um, because my, our focus was Canada. Like, I needed to get to Canada. Because at that point, uh, the Governor General, Mikhail Dejean, she opened the borders for refugees. So long story short, we got there. As soon as we just closed to the line of the border, I jumped out of the car. We had our letter of departure. I just put it right smack in the face of the officer. I'm like, I need to get in. Uh, and in long story short, here we are. Uh, so, <laughs> so for me, it was this idea, again, of resilience, but also, um, and it's gonna, I'm going to tie it into uh, my, my um, tonight, this idea of going, knowing where you're going. Uh, and, and the fact that we were so focused on the Ambassador Bridge, this is where we wanted to get to. And we did not let that deviate us from, from where we needed to go. And I wanted to start with a quote by uh, an author, I think his, uh, his name is Leon Blois. He said, the only real sadness, the only real failure, the only great tragedy in life is not becoming a saint. And he says, why not? Why? Because to be anything less than holy is to remain unnaturalized. And that to me is so powerful, this idea of holiness. What is holiness? Uh, we have this, you know, the moment we think of holiness, we think of our saints in the Catholic Church, you know, being proclaimed as a saint, and so on, you know, and, and you know, interceding for prayers and so on. But I wanted to get to, I uh, wanted to break my talk into two parts. One, why is it so important for us to strive for holiness? And number two, how do we achieve it, or how do we engage in this process of holiness? 
Uh, a scripture passage that I love a lot when it comes to this is, well, first I'm going to talk about um, the origin of why I believe holiness is so important for our lives is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God was creating us, he says, let us make man in our image after our own likeness. What is so beautiful about Genesis is when God is creating everything else, for example, he's creating the sun, he speaks to the void, he's creating birds, he speaks to the air, you know, and whatever God spoke to, out of that he created whatever uh, needed to be created, which is why, for example, a fish cannot live outside of water, right? And a bird, after a certain point, uh, if it doesn't fly, uh, assuming that it is volatile, that, that it can fly, it, it will end up dying. And uh, uh, for example, a mammal, like a dog or a cat, a dog, cats don't like water, um, a dog does not live or cannot live underwater. And what is so interesting is when God is creating us, he doesn't speak to the, to the air, he doesn't speak to the ground, he doesn't speak to him, he spoke to himself. Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. And whenever I think about that, it reminds me of St. Augustine when he says, You have made us for you, Lord, and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. So this idea that our origin is from God for us to be God-like, to, to share in that, that unity with God is so absolutely important. And also... That entails a relationship, that we are called to have a relationship with our Lord. Uh, not to, and I remember when I was back home, uh, my grandfather, uh, he was a peculiar man. Whenever it was time for, for example, report cards, if you, for example, if you got like an A+, plus, for us it was, it was numbers, but if you got like an A+, plus, he was happy the first time. You get an A+, plus the second time, he's kind of clapping slower. You get an A+, plus the third time, he's not clapping. He's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, grandpa, like I, I passed, I'm good. And he's like, I don't see, he's, his thing is, and he used to say this to us, if you are at the head of your class and stay ahead of your class all the time, you're in the wrong class. He says there needs to be progression. There needs to be this, uh, this thing that you're working towards. Because other than that, you're, you're stagnating. So for him, it was, it was not just a personal relationship, it was a personal dynamic relationship with God. And that relationship um, is, is wrapped around, uh, and, and I used to say religion is an eternal relationship that is strengthened by rules and defined by boundaries. Here's what I mean by this. And he used to give us this analogy. He says, let's say exhibit A, you have a young lady, she goes out right, with her friends, and single, and this guy walks up to her during their outing, and the guy goes something like this. Uh, excuse me, um, you are not to talk to anyone else in this room. But to what, uh, when you get home, you text me. Before you go to sleep, you text me. When you wake up, you text me. On your way to work, you text me. You get to lunch, you text me. When you leave work, you text me, and so on and so forth. The moment that happens in your head, as you're like, uh, psycho? <laughs> what is wrong with you? But now let's say exhibit B, you, uh, let's say you're married and your husband or your wife, they're, uh, let's stick with the lady, like your husband is on, let's say business, world, or he has a family uh, gathering, you are not able to go. So you went out with the ladies. There are some conversations you will not have with other men in the room. You may say hi, but there are some conversations that are off limits. You get home, as soon as you get home, you may not have an extensive conversation, but you'll say, no, hey babe, I got, I got home, have a good night, I hope you're, everything's fine. You wake up in the morning, same thing. You get to work, I made it safely, whatever. It's still the same thing, but what changed was the relationship. Lack of relationship, and one of the things that you might say to the guy in the first scenario is, why are you imposing your rules on me? Because we don't have a relationship. But if there's a relationship, it's almost uh, an understatement that there will be communication. So this idea of relationship is so important as we talk about holiness, that to be in a state of relationship with, with, with the Lord and to speak to Him. And allow Him to speak back. Okay. Uh, and lastly, 
within this the, this this part is um, once you foster relationship, then it creates an atmosphere or a room for love. And what I what I love about love is it demands certain things. For example, let's say if you have your significant other, husband or wife, and she she or she says, "Hi, I love you." One of the things that you will not say, "Oh, is that's that's so nice." <laughs> You won't say that as a response. The response will be something like, I love you too. Because it, it, it requires certain responses. And we know that once we are in a relationship with our Lord, uh, what we are called to do is to know Him, love Him, and serve Him. Um, I can remember in my own life when you know, uh, things get hard, and um, remember when I first came to Toronto and I didn't have any friends, I didn't have any family here. It was just my mom and I. Uh, the only person that I could have turned to in certain times was, was our Lord. And to talk to him and allow him to talk back. Um, and also, the last thing for me is holiness is important because we were destined to reign with Christ. A beautiful passage that encapsulates this for me is in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, where when Jesus is speaking to the sheep, not the ghost, the sheep, he says, Come, O blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you, not yesterday, not when you just got here, we're just making things, but since the foundation of the world. So from eternity, God has made this plan for us to reign with him. And if we're reigning with him, then that means we're sitting beside him, you know, in his know, being in his glory. Uh, and for me, I, I think whenever I think of that, that is so, such a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful message. Uh, and St. Paul even echoes this in Galatians. He says, we are no longer slaves, but sons. <coughs> and if sons, then heirs. That's why whenever we're uh, in, in, uh, in our youth ministry, in our, especially with our teenagers, I always tell them, no labels, no titles. The only label or title that not, that ultimately matters is the, is the fact that you're an heir. You're an heir of Almighty God. And that fuels everything else. So now that we talked a little bit about um, holiness, how do we achieve it? Uh, some practical uh, parts. First thing, one of the things I always like to talk about in terms of holiness is what it actually means. Uh, it means to be set apart. The moment you are set apart, that means you've been set apart for a specific task. Let's say, for example, during Mass, uh, Father Peter won't you know, celebrate Mass with the chalice, and then immediately after, pour some orange juice in there. Okay? Like he, that chalice has been set apart for a specific task. So that means for us, our lives, we have been set apart for a specific task that God wants us to do. Um, and also, it also means that by virtue of our baptism, that we have been positioned in Christ. This idea that Jesus came and redeemed us, he, put, he allowed us to have his life, this unmerited gift. But now, holiness is this act of us possessing him, is to continuously walk after him daily. As he says, if you are to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, not like whenever you feel like it. And I think that's why this, uh, this, this, this virtue of, of, of resilience is so important because crosses get heavy. I don't know if anyone here has ever gone through times in life where you just want to just sit in a corner and just let life pass by. But you know if you do that, then you're missing out on a potential blessing that God has for you. So you're like, oh, okay, whatever. And then you muster up your courage. It could be in school, it could be in family, and you muster up your courage. You're like, I'm gonna do one more day. One of the things that uh, we get the opportunity to do in our ministry is uh, to connect with, with kids, and then when we connect with them, we, we, they open up to us about their sense of anxiety and so on. And sometimes we, uh, I usually, well, uh, last year, I used to get calls at like 10 o'clock in the morning where some of them were freaking out completely. And they can't sleep, everything is just clouded in their head. And I would say, just give it one more day. 
one more day. Go to sleep, wake up one more day. Give it your best tomorrow. Uh, and, and this idea of continuously getting up one more time. Um, Christ uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, for me, gives this beautiful example. And I call it the Divine Declaration of Independence. It's kind of like my title for it. Uh, they're like, you're so American. I'm like, no, I'm Haitian. Right. Um, uh, where it says, in verse 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first. Not seek uh, secondly, thirdly, or if you want to, seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And then everything else will be given unto you. One of the things that I love is he didn't say men seek first. He didn't say women seek first. He didn't say children seek first. He said seek first, period. So this idea that all of us are called to seek the kingdom. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what's going on. Your duty first is to seek the kingdom of God. And for me, this was such an earth shock. I remember the first time this really penetrated my heart. For me, I call it the equal opportunity to be unequal. Where you have an equal opportunity to be unequal because you are unique. And that's the whole call to holiness. Okay? Um... Also, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 6, um, and I love this. This, for me, I call it, in, in my previous life, what, what, as a, not previous life, as a career <laughs> but in my previous life, and uh, as a process coordinator, one of the things that we're supposed to do is to create metrics to test the health of a process. If the process is not following these metrics, or it's not meeting it, then the process is not healthy. It's, broke, it's breaking down. And you have to find a way to recalibrate and, and, and create other, uh, other metrics to, to or, or just create a whole process altogether. And for me, Luke chapter 6, verse 20, all the way to 26, is this beautiful, I encourage you to read it. This is a this beautiful passage where Jesus is speaking to his apostles because it starts by saying, then he looked up at his disciples. Meaning what he's about to say is not for everybody, it's for his disciples. And he says, blessed are you who are poor, for you is the kingdom of, of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are, are you when um, people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. And he goes on, and then he goes in verse 24, and the woes, and says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full. And, and, and the verse goes uh, continuing to 26. What I love about this verse is, I, I like to categorize it in my question, is where are you lacking God? If you always feel in your life during the moment of prayer and contemplation, and you always feel yourself in some areas of your life where you feel weak, you feel spiritually poor, this is where God is calling you to seek Him so that He can fill you. Uh, verse 22 is for me, this is where you know you're in line with God. When you're doing things and people are looking at you, some of my most um, dearest, uh, uh, some of the most dearest nick uh, nicknames that I received from a couple of my friends, uh, when I remember when I first came here, they used to call me Jesus Freak. Some people <laughs> called me Church Boy. Uh, because for me, it was all about the Lord. So when I heard that, I'm like, okay, I'm doing something right. <laughs> I'm doing something right because I'm in line with God. And the last part is, woe to you who are rich. What, what does that mean? Woe to you that you, are, you have this, this attitude that, you know, it's always about you. Then you know at that point, this is where you're lacking. You're losing God in your life. So where are you lacking God? Where are you in line with God? And where are you losing it? On your journey to holiness. And you keep that as a metric. Right? Um, and finally, for me, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and, and I'll close off with this, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a beautiful passage because it displays three philosophies of life. One is the philosophy of the robbers, the other is the philosophy of the Levite priest, and then the third one is the philosophy of the Good Samaritan. 
If you remember the story, the guys that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho got, got beaten half to death. And then uh, we hear uh, a Levite priest uh, was walking, kind of goes the other way, and uh, a couple of people were walking up, and the Samaritan comes in, finds his wounds. The robbers, the philosophy of the robber is, what you have is mine, and I'll take it. That, unfortunately, is the philosophy that a lot of the world is employing today. Where whatever you have, and I want it, I will take it by any means necessary. It's very, it's very prevalent in our society. The second one, though, of the Levites is, I think for me, the most dangerous one. Is what I have is mine, and I'll keep it. Because for the Levite priest to touch the dead, they had to go through a long series of purifications. So they didn't want to do that. A lot of times, we find, even me, we find ourselves in some situations where people need help, and we know. But it's so inconvenient. My gosh, I got to take two more buses to go home. Or, oh my goodness, like I'm going to have to study two more hours after I help you. Like, no, who needs that? But this idea of indifference is very dangerous. And the last one is the, 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 the philosophy of the Good Samaritan, which is what I have is yours, and I'll share. What I have is all yours. And this is the philosophy of our Lord, where he gives us everything. And to close, uh, I wanted to share a story that my, not a story, something that happened with my grandfather. Anyone here that, uh, for example, if you're born in the Caribbeans, or uh, because I don't even know the Caribbeans, grandparents have this very bad habit <coughs> of bringing a life lesson out of literally nowhere. <coughs> like it's it's so it's it's so awkward. You could be sitting and you're having fun with them, and then they're just like, "My son," I'm like, "Oh, come on." <laughs> So one time, we were in the countryside in the south of Haiti, and we were sitting with him, and uh, we were just having fun, talking to each other, like, oh, how do we know if we meet the right woman, and whatever, I mean, just our, our, us, us, our cousins, or the boys. And we went to our, our grandfather, kind of asking him jokingly, how do we know if you meet the right woman? And he said, it's not your business. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm like, okay, grandpa, what do you mean? He says, it's not your business to find your woman, your business is to run after God as fast as you can. It says, whoever's running beside you, that's your wife. Whoever's running beside you, that's your husband. But your job is to run after God. And it reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, since we are surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, let us therefore remove the shackle and run our race. Because our Lord has won the race for us, all we need to do is to run it. And we don't stop until we get to our ambassador brief for it. In my case, or our finish line, which is heaven. So this idea of holiness is all about possessing Christ, positioning ourselves in him, possessing him, and running towards him. And we don't stop until we reach our destination, which is our heavenly kingdom. Thank you.